All right. Everyone's microphones have been muted, and I encourage you to use the chat box if you have questions that come up along the way. Sorry, I'm getting uh, more requests for the live transcription. So please use the chat box as we go. We will try to answer the questions as they pop up if we see them, but there will be time at the end to answer all of the questions that we have. So today we're going to talk about ototoxic medications and how your prescription drugs may be affecting your ears. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel, please like this video if you find it helpful and subscribe to our channel. And if you're watching this live with us today, please write down our Facebook address there, facebook.com slash UNCHCC so that you can go on and it will link to our YouTube channel and you can get updates whenever we post new videos. I work at the UNC Hearing and Communication Center and we are part of the UNC Chapel Hill School of Medicine. We are a nonprofit faculty practice of doctors of audiology. We also serve as a training clinic for doctoral students that are going through the graduate program at UNC Chapel Hill. At our clinic, we work with all hearing aid models and manufacturers, and we run on an unbundled or fee-for-service business model. We additionally offer vestibular or balance testing and tinnitus specialty testing. Um, and we have two locations now. Our main clinic is on Farrington Road in Chapel Hill, and we have a satellite clinic in Hillsborough, North Carolina. But for appointments at either location, you can call the number on the screen in front of you. With me today is Dr. Morgan Selick, who is a neurotology assistant professor at UNC Chapel Hill. She attended medical school at Drexel University and completed both her residency and neurootology fellowship at UNC Chapel Hill Otolaryngology. Her clinical interests include hearing loss, cochlear implants, ear disease, vestibular schwannomas, and skull-based disorders and her contact information is on the screen in front of you. Today's slides will also be shared in the chat box at the end of our talk. So if you don't get a chance to jot down our contact information, you'll be able to download it at the end. So today we wanna to talk, of course, about ototoxicity and uh, the Google captions tend to not like the word ototoxic. So hopefully you can decipher the captioning as it goes. We'll also talk about the signs and symptoms of what a hearing loss due to toxic medication looks like, how it's diagnosed in the clinic. And Dr. Selick will talk about what makes a drug ototoxic and how it can damage the ear. So ototoxicity refers to the ability of a substance to potentially harm the ear. There are two parts of the inner ear. One part is responsible for hearing and the other is responsible for balance. So there are a couple other terms related to ototoxicity that are more specific. Cochleotoxic, meaning potentially harmful to the hearing part of the inner ear or the cochlea. And vestibulotoxic, meaning potentially harmful to the vestibular system or the balance or motion sensing part of the inner ear. So the effects of ototoxic agents really gained recognition among medical professionals after World War II and the widespread use of antibiotics. And over the next several decades, the pharmaceutical industry exploded and they invested billions of dollars and we rapidly evolved with hundreds and thousands of new drugs on the market. And as a result of this explosion of new drugs, there are a lot of ototoxic substances out there. And there are currently over 600 known categories of drugs that are potentially ototoxic. So some signs and symptoms that are common when someone has hearing loss due to an ototoxic medication may include ringing in the ears, hearing loss in one or both ears, dizziness or imbalance, 
dizziness or vertigo, excuse me, which is a spinning sensation and oscillopsia, which is the sensation of your eyes or vision jumping around even when you're still. And these may be temporary or permanent. Some examples of ototoxic substances are aminoglycoside antibiotics, cytotoxic agents, which are chemotherapy drugs, loop diuretics, antiprotozoals or antimalarial drugs, anti-seizure drugs, heparin antagonists, beta blockers, and things like environmental toxins and aerosols. So how is hearing loss due to an ototoxic medication diagnosed? Well, there's not a test for ototoxic hearing loss. So the diagnosis really comes from a combination of a patient history with their medications list, what kind of symptoms they're having, and the test results from a hearing test. And the people that are involved in making this diagnosis are the audiologist who conducts the hearing test and diagnoses the type and severity of hearing loss, but not necessarily the cause. And then the ENT or other physician is involved in looking into, well, what is the cause of this hearing loss? Is it the medication? And possibly adjusting medications if needed. So when someone comes in, we're looking for if they have a history of chemotherapy, if they have a history of taking aminoglycoside antibiotics, their symptoms are really important. Are they having tinnitus that recently started after they started chemotherapy? Muffled hearing, dizziness, earfulness. And do they have a high frequency hearing loss or do, does the test show some reduced outer hair cell function. So I mentioned this reduced outer hair cell function because that's the part of the ear that's really affected by these medications. And you'll see in these pictures, pictures of little normal hair cells in our inner ear. And when we take medications, they, they can sometimes truly damage quite remarkably a lot of these hair cells. Because these hair cells are arranged by frequency, we'll see a drastic change in hearing from low frequencies being almost normal hearing, like on this graph. And then it drops down to a really severe hearing loss quite suddenly. And this is really a hallmark for hearing loss due to medication. It's a little bit tricky because their hearing loss due to age and noise exposure also happens in the high frequency range. So there are some layers to this. And that's why a case history and medications list is so important to making a diagnosis. So after we test, we talk about the results and recommendations with you, and the results are forwarded to the prescribing doctor, an ENT that's involved, and or the primary care physician of that patient. And then the physician or the prescribing doctor will make recommendations or determine whether or not to change medications. So at this point, I'm going to switch it over to Dr. Selick, and I'm going to let her share her screen so that she can use the captions through Google Slides. Hi, everyone. So good afternoon. I'm going to talk about how the ototoxicity actually happens. So how do we take these medications and how do we end up with having these ototoxic effects. Well, when you think about the ear, we're looking at this um, slide here on the right, you can see the parts in blue, the external ear, the ear canal, and then the parts in orange are hearing bones. None of that is what is affected by these medications. It's really those parts in pink that we're talking about that get affected. So you can see that snail-like structure, that's the cochlea. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on one second, let me turn on my Got to turn on my captions. There we go. So the parts that are going to be affected by these ototoxic medications are going to be the parts in pink. So you see that snail-like structure, that's the cochlea, which is responsible for hearing. And then we have the vestibular system, which is those McDonald's-like arches. 
that's going to be responsible for our balance. And that's where those medications are going to actually make a difference. So if we zoom in on the cochlea, it's these hair cells that we were discussing earlier that get injured by these medications. So these medications get picked up by these cells and they create what's called a reactive oxygen species. It's essentially a bad molecule that causes damage to the hair cells. And so once these hair cells become damaged, that's when we see the side effects. And we're gonna see things like hearing loss. We can also see things like hyperacusis, increased sensitivity to noise, also ringing of the ears. And we're also gonna see balance issues, whether that be imbalance or unsteadiness or vertigo with room spinning. So what classes of medications can cause ototoxicity? There are a whole variety of these. I'm gonna hit on some of the more common medications talking about antibiotics first. So there's some pretty impressively large antibiotics, things like gentamicin, vancomycin, neomycin that can cause ototoxicity. But then there are also some more common ones, erythromycin, azithromycin, and quinines. Now we have two types of outcomes that we can see with ototoxic medications. We can see irreversible changes, which essentially means that even once you stop the medication, you're still gonna to continue to have the side effects, whether that be hearing loss or balance issues, or you can have reversible side effects. So after the medication has been stopped and gets out of the system, the patients are able to repair those hair cells and have improvement in terms of their hearing and balance. Then there's also chemotherapy agents. These are well known to cause hearing loss. In eight adults, it's about 80% of individuals who undergo these agents that will see hearing loss. And unfortunately, this is irreversible. Cisplatin and carboplatin are the main offenders. You might think, well, if there's all these side effects and all this ototoxicity, why would these medications ever be prescribed? Well, a lot of these remain in use despite these side effects, just because there's no safe and equally effective alternative to these life-saving medications. So it's a really thinking about the risk-benefit analysis when we think about prescribing these medications to patients. There are also some more common medications, some of which are prescribed for kidney or heart issues, things like furosemide, trosemide, Celebrex, but then also medications that we all commonly buy over the counter, things like aspirin, ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, and Motrin that also can cause ototoxic effects. Luckily, most of these are reversible. So who's going to end up developing ototoxicity? Well, drug-induced hearing loss is quite variable and it's highly inconsistent. So you can have two people that receive the same medication at the same dose, and one person might experience hearing loss and the other might not. So there are some risk factors that make patients at increased risk for ototoxicity. One thing would be age extremes. So the very young and then the very old will be at increased risk for ototoxicity. Having any kind of previous history of hearing loss, hydration status, then the dose, duration, and mode of administration. So anytime we increase the dose of a medication, the longer you're taking it. Or when we think about mode of administration, anytime we're giving a medication through the IV, all of those are going to increase your risk or ototoxicity. Any kind of renal insufficiency, so if the kidneys aren't working very well, that's going to mean that you'll have more of that drug in the system and can have increased risk for ototoxicity. If you're using other ototoxic agents, they have additive effects. And then if you've had any kind of history of radiation to your head in, in the past, will also mean that you have increased risk for ototoxicity. So what is our formula for dealing with these kind of medications? Well, particularly when we start some of these larger antibiotics or chemotherapy agents, and we're really thinking about effects of ototoxicity, we want to start with a baseline hearing test. So this would be before you even receive the medication. And then we think about repeating the hearing test at a set interval. And this depends on the type of medication that's being given to patients, and but one potential um, interval that we might see would be at one week, three months, six months, and then annually for up to 10 years. And it depends on what we see as to what we do. But if we notice any kind of ototoxicity, 
So whether the patient is reporting tinnitus, we notice hearing loss on the audiogram, or the patient's reporting dizziness, we might wanna consider changing treatment. That might mean a different medication. It might just mean reducing the dose of that medication. But again, this depends. Some medications can be changed and others can't. So sometimes we have to do what's called just manage the outcome. So if we have hearing loss, sometimes that means patients need hearing aids, or if the hearing loss is significant enough, cochlear implants. And then for balance issues, things like vestibular therapy. So what is it that you can do about this? So I think the main thing is to maintain awareness. So if you notice tinnitus, which is usually one of the first signs, so a high-pitched ringing, ear fullness, reduce in hearing, or some kind of imbalance, you need to alert someone. So either the prescribing physician, the physician that gave you the medication that you think might be responsible for this. Of course, your primary care physician is always a great resource or making an appointment with an ENT or an audiologist to get it worked up. So at this point, I'll take back over. I first, before I go, let's see. I'll turn my captions back on. So at this point, we'll look to the chat box for questions. I'm going to stop the recording that's on YouTube. So if you're watching this right now from YouTube, thank you for watching and be sure to check out our other videos. Uh, hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.